Hello, um, good evening. We're going to do um, another lightning round this evening. Uh, and we'll get started once there's a lot of people here. If you're watching the recording, it'll take a couple of minutes for a lot of people to hear for the live session. So just bear with me for a minute and we will get started. <clears throat> Tonight's questions will be coming from uh, Leek's third edition from the FNP book. So there will be pediatrics and adult questions. Uh, so then this is for family nurse practitioner. Um, you can definitely watch if you're AGNP, just ignore the pediatric questions um, since there are only be a few of those kind of split throughout. But as soon as we have, you know, five to ten people, we'll get started. Um, but um, we'll wait until we have that many so we can get going. Comment and see. Uh, say that you're here. Say hi. Where are you watching from? I'm in South Carolina. It is beautiful and sunny here. And the high was like 68 today. It was great. <laughs> All right, as soon as we have a few more people, I'll go ahead and get started. Sometimes it takes people a while to get logged in. All right, let's do our first question while we're waiting, and then you know, people can just kind of catch up when they get here, okay? All right, first question. So this, how this is a work, I'll ask you the question. Um, I will read all the options, and then I'll repeat it, so in case you didn't hear something I said, that you'll be able to catch it, and then you go ahead and type in your answer, you know, A, B, C, or D, and then after, you know, most people have gotten a chance to reply and put their guess down, we'll go over the correct answer, and then I'll do any education that we need, you know, talk about, you know, why we arrived at the correct answer and, you know, any, you know, further information about that specific topic that we can kind of cover, okay? So first question, uh, during a sports physical exam of a 14-year-old high school athlete, the nurse practitioner notices a split of the S2 component of the heart sound during deep inspiration. She notes that it disappears upon expiration. The heart rate is regular and no murmurs are oscillated. Which of the following is correct? Okay. And we got a 14-year-old athlete. The nurse practitioner notices a split of the S2 component of the heart sound during deep inspiration. She notes that it disappears upon expiration. The heart rate is regular and no murmurs are oscillated. Which of the following is correct? A, this is an abnormal finding and should be evaluated further by a cardiologist. B, a stress test should be ordered. C, this is a normal finding in some young athletes, or D, an echocardiogram should be ordered. And A, this is an abnormal finding and should be evaluated further by a cardiologist. B, a stress test should be ordered. C, this is a normal finding in some young athletes, or D, an echocardiogram should be ordered. So give our participants a couple minutes to answer that. Good, Gail. Yep. Good. Good, Anita. Yep, you got it right, Carrie. Yep, good, Janet. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, excellent. So, yes, this is a normal finding in young um, in young athletes, so it's just a split S2. Uh, as long as it's disappearing on expiration, we can consider it normal as long as you know, there's nothing else going on. It's just the aortic and pulmonary valves kind of closing at slightly different times, and that's okay. Um, that we can also take that in the young athlete. So that is a split S2. That is normal. All right, our next question. A 65-year-old man with a BMI of 30 and a history of asthma has hypertension that has been well controlled with hydrochlorothiazide 12.5 milligrams PO daily. His total cholesterol is 230. How many risk factors for coronary artery disease does he have? One, two, three, or four. I'll review him as, again, okay? 65 year old man with a BMI of 30 and a history of asthma has hypertension that has been well controlled with HCTZ 12.5 milligrams PO daily. 
His total cholesterol is 230. How many risk factors for coronary artery disease does he have? One, two, three, or four? One, two, three, or four risk factors. 65 year old man, BMI is 30, history of asthma, hypertension, well controlled with HCTZ, cholesterol is 230. How many risk factors does he have? Put your guess down. One, two, three, or four. After I get some guesses there, I want you guys to tell me what they are. Like how Ann did it. I like how Ann did it. Okay. A lot of varied answers. Okay, so we got a couple of different things there. Okay, so this patient has four risk factors. Four risk factors. What are his four risk factors? What do we think it is? 65 year old man, BMI 30, history of asthma, hypertension, cholesterol. And he's got four risk factors. What of those are his four things? All right, think about that in your head, okay? All right, his four risk factors is the fact that he is a 65-year-old male. That's risk factor one. Risk factor two is that he is overweight. His BMI is 30. His third risk factor is hypertension. And his fourth risk factor is that high cholesterol. So those four all um, make up his risk factors for coronary artery disease. All of those have an effect. Okay. All right. If you have any questions as we go along, please, you know, type them over there. Um, I'll try to catch it as we go. Of course, another participant can always, you know, type in and try to answer the question as well. Um, but do know that I, I do look over there and try to see if you're asking any questions. Okay. Um, next question. A common side effect of metformin therapy is? A common side effect of metformin therapy is? A, weight gain. B, lactic acidosis, C, hypoglycemic episodes, or D, diarrhea. Again, A, weight gain, B, lactic acidosis, C, hypoglycemic episodes, and D, diarrhea. Good, good, good. Yep, you got it, Sandra. Good, Glenda. Good, Ann. Try again, Gail. Good, Anita. Good, Dana. Excellent. Yep, let's see if we got any more, buddy. I want to see answers. Try again, Emmy. Good, L. Yep. Yep, good, Carrie. You got it. Good. Yep, the answer to this one is D, diarrhea. I always expect that there will be a couple of people that choose lactic acidosis for this one. But when we look back at the question, we try to answer the question that is there. The question specifically says a common side effect, common side effect of metformin therapy is. The most common side effect from metformin therapy is GI upset, for sure. Lactic acidosis is incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, and typically, um, you know, only seen in patients who possibly have like severe kidney disease. And again, it's not necessarily been tested in metformin. It was tested in a sister drug that's chemically similar. And so there was a risk factor with that medication with lactic acidosis. So there's an assumed risk factor with metformin. The reason I go into all of that extra stuff that you don't necessarily need to know is so hopefully that you remember in the future. Common is definitely the diarrhea, the GI upset. Un super rare, very uncommon is the lactic acidosis. Um, but it is associated vaguely with metformin, okay? All right, our next question is, <clears throat> while doing a cardiac exam on a 45-year-old man, you note an irregular rhythm with a pulse rate of 110 beats per minute. The patient is alert and is not in distress. What is the most likely diagnosis? A, AFib, B, VFib, C, cardiac arrhythmia, 
or D, a first degree right bundle branch block. I'll read it again. Uh, while doing a cardiac exam on a 45 year old man, you note an irregular rhythm with a pulse rate of 110 beats per minute. Patient is alert and not in distress. What is the most likely diagnosis? A, AFib, B, VFib, C, cardiac arrhythmia, or D, a first degree right bundle branch block. Yeah, you guys got it. You guys got it, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep, we're looking for this patient to most likely have AFib. It's common. A lot of patient, people can tolerate that, especially this 45-year-old guy. He you know, might not even notice it. Um, you know, of course, we're going to order an EKG on this patient, see what he's got, you know, maybe go ahead and start him on. Uh, you know, some Xarelto or something like that. There, there's been so much studies done on those medications at this point that I worked for cardiology for a while, and before I graduated, I said, hey, what are you comfortable with me doing as an FNP before I send the patient to you? And, if, and I said, you know, patient's got AFib, it's clear, it's obvious, it's on the EKG, they got the symptoms, you know, et cetera. What are you comfortable with me doing? And he said, there is absolutely no reason for an FNP not to go ahead and start metoprolol and some type of anticoagulant. There's no reason that that can't be handled by family practice and then sent over to cardiology to follow up. And if I want to change something, fine. You know, something that's better for their specific, you know, dysrhythmia, maybe metoprolol is not cutting it by the time they get to me and I need to change it. But, you know, he was all about, you know, there's been so many studies on those medications for AFib that there's no reason that we can't do that. So that's just kind of like a side note for when you guys pass your boards and get to go out there and, you know, be the FNP. Um, that that's something that you can you can do and manage on your own. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Our next question: uh, The nurse practitioner is evaluating patients who are at high risk for complications due to UTIs. Which of the following patients does not belong in this category? So we're evaluating patients who are at high risk for complications due to UTIs. Which of the following patients does not belong in this category? A. A 38 year old diabetic patient with an A1C of 7.5%, B, a woman with RA who is being treated with methotrexate and low-dose steroids, C, a 21-year-old woman who has a history of IBS, or D, a pregnant woman. I'll read through those again. And we're looking for the one that does not have a high risk for complications due to UTIs. A, 38-year-old diabetic patient with an A1C of 7.5, B, a woman with RA who is being treated with methotrexate and low-dose steroids. C, a 21-year-old woman who has a history of IBS. Or D, a pregnant woman. Which one of those does not belong? Good. Yeah, Blendy, you got it. Good, Anne. Good, Anita. Yep, Gail, you got it. Mm -hmm. Good, Carrie. Yep. Yep, Dana, good, Robert. Yep. Yep, good, Sandra. Mm hmm Elle, you got it. Mm hmm good, Janelle, good, Kira. Good, yep. Everyone got that one right. Yeah, but 21-year-old woman who has a history of IBS um, that's not associated with a high risk for UTI. Of course, things that are associated with the high risk for UTI and complications therein. Uh, female. Pregnancy, spermicide use, um, new sex partner, urinary incontinence, cystocele, uh, postmenopausal because they have the decreased amount of estrogen, and estrogen is very protective of that, you know, the area down there. Um, so all those things can put you at risk for UTIs. And of course, the diabetic patient, you know, the A1C is high, 7.5, that means we possibly might have a little bit of sugar in our urine. And of course, sugar is a great breeding ground for bacteria, so all those people are definitely at risk. All right, next question. Uh, a 68-year-old woman with hypertension and diabetes is seen by the nurse practitioner for a dry cough that worsens at night when she lies in bed. She has shortness of breath, with which worsens when she exerts herself and has gained six pounds during the past two months. Her pulse rate is 90 beats per minute and regular. 
she is on a nitroglycerin patch and furosemide daily. The best explanation for her symptoms is A, kidney failure, B, congestive heart failure, C, ACE I induced coughing, uh, like ACE inhibitor induced coughing, or D, thyroid disease. A, kidney failure, B, congestive heart failure, C, an ACE inhibitor induced cough, or D, thyroid disease. Which of these is her most likely diagnosis? Good. Good, Sandra, good L. Good, Glenda. Good, 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 Carrie, good, Robert. Good, Anita. Try again, Gail R. Good, Vivian. Try again, Janelle. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Janelle, you got it right. Sorry. All right, excellent. Yep. The answer to this one is B, CHF. This patient clearly has CHF problems. CHF symptoms is uh, shortness of breath when lying down, shortness of breath from like going up the stairs with activity, walking to the mailbox, um, increased weight gain of late. Um, typically, when we think someone is at risk for like a crisis or hospital admission, is a two pound weight gain, two to three pounds in a day or five pounds in one week. Typically, patients can't gain fat that fast. It's water weight, and that means they're holding on to, to more and more fluids. Um, so those are kind of our, you know, red flag criteria. Uh, her pulse rate is, you know, 90 and regular, so that means to me, you know, it's not like an AFib problem where she's got a poor, um, you know, cardiac output because she's got poor contractility of her heart, so that's not where the fluid is backing up from because AFib can cause you know, this fluid to back up as well. She's also got a nitro patch and some furosemide, so I'm thinking, okay, we definitely have a cardiac history here. Furosemide, aka Lasix, is a water water pill or a diuretic. So again, all of those point towards my CHF. Um, yeah, an ACE I induced cough is kind of like this continuous cough, so it wouldn't have been worse at night. <laughs> and the history would hopefully mention something about her being on like lisinopril. Okay. All right, our next question is a 40-year-old white woman with a BMI of 32 complains of colicky pain in the right upper quadrant of her abdomen. That gets worse if she eats fried food. So already start getting in your head. What's your diagnosis? Okay, during the physical exam, the nurse practitioner presses deeply on the left lower quadrant of the abdomen. After she releases her hand, the patient complains of pain on the right side of the lower abdomen. What is the name of this finding? A, rebound tenderness, B, Robsing sign, C, Murphy's sign, or D, psoas test? A, rebound tenderness, B, Robsing sign, C, Murphy's sign, or D, psoas test? So the nurse practitioner pressed deeply on the left lower quadrant of the abdomen. After she releases her hand, the patient complains of pain on the right side of the lower abdomen. Which one of those was the finding? Lost my mouse for a second. Yep. Yep, yep, good, good, good. Yep, yep, yep. Mm, get in mostly right, you guys. It's the option that I thought would be the trip up is being the trip up. I'm seeing a couple of those. Okay. The correct answer for this one is B, Robsing's sign. Um, the, uh, the one that I saw that a couple people picked was rebound tenderness. So rebound tenderness would be more descriptive if where I was actually pushing and released there, the pain was where I pushed. So in this case, it said I pushed on the left side and the right side hurt when I let go. That's called Robsing's sign, and the way that I always remember that is that it sings about the other side. So the left side sings about the right side, Robsing. Um, and that's kind of my goofy thing to try to remember that sign. Again, one of the things that I really try to drive home as a tutor is that 
boards really love for you to know the names of all of these signs and you will have these on your boards and I can't you know guarantee or tell you which ones it's going to be <laughs> but I really encourage you to be familiar with all of them okay and if you're not you know you see one on an on option in here and you're like oh I don't know what SOAS test is or Murphy's test is or any of that what I do is I go to YouTube I type it into YouTube so that I can watch somebody doing it because I'm a very visual person. And after I've seen somebody do it, it kind of sticks with me a little bit better. So um, if there's a ever a test or a finding that you're unfamiliar with, you know, try to, you know, look it up on YouTube. Okay. All right, our next question. <clears throat> Which of the following viral infections is associated with occasional abnormal forms of lymphocytes during an acute infection? Which of the following viral infections is associated with occasional abnormal forms of lymphocytes during an acute infection? Um, A. Cytomegalovirus or CMV. B. Epstein Barr virus and EBV. C, human papillomavirus, or HPV. D, Coxsackie virus. Okay, which of the following viral infections is associated with occasional abnormal forms of lymphocytes during an acute infection? A, cytomegalovirus. B, Epstein-Barr. C, HPV. Or D, Coxsackie's. Which one? This is a tough one. Yep, good. Yep, 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 good. Yep, because you're thinking about what does EBV cause? What does EBV cause? Mm hmm Yep, so the answer to this one is B, the Epstein-Barr virus. If you think about EBV, um, it causes mono, um, and sometimes when we have mono and you do a serology test, you might see um, increased number of lymphocytes, elevated white blood cells, um, and then of course a positive reaction to your mono spot test. Uh, the further down you go from the initial contraction of mono, the more positive the mono spot is. So like in week one, it's only like 68% sensitive, but the closer you get to week six, the more like the higher that percentage gets, um, the further you get out. So if you have a negative, this is like a clinical tip. So if you have a negative mono spot, you know, you don't have to rule out mono because again, it's only like 68% sensitive in that first week. Uh, again, the serology is, you know, could be abnormal. I mean, even the way the question is formatted, it says occasional abnormal forms. It's not guaranteed that your, you know, your CBC is going to look odd with mono. So again, don't let that in your clinical setting force you to rule out mono as a diagnosis. Really base it off of symptoms. And your symptoms of mono, of course, are going to be, you know, you can, it looks, it looks a lot like strep inside, of course. So, um, but you also have anterior and posterior cervical lymphadenopathy, whereas strep throat is only anterior. The other thing is the age group is a lot different. If you're thinking strep, you're thinking age 5 to 15. If you're thinking mono, you're thinking like 15 to 30. Um, so there's a couple different ways for you to kind of differentiate mono because the lab tests, the mono spot are not great. Uh, so just some side notes about mono. But again, Epstein-Barr virus, again, that's the cause of mono. Could cause some changes in your serology. Okay. All right. Next question. A fontal nevus is a sign of which of the following? Fontal nevus is a sign of which of the following? A, Down syndrome. B, infantile scoliosis. C, congenital heart disease. Or D, spina bifida. Fontal nevus, sign of which? A, Down syndrome. B, infantile scoliosis. C, congenital heart disease. Or D, spina bifida. Which one's that? Good, good guys. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. Let's put a few more answers. 
Yep, we're seeing good things so far. Excellent. Yes, the answer to this one would be D, spina bifida. D, spina bifida. So that fawn tail nevus, I always think of a, it's not spelled like fawn, like a deer, but I always think of like a fawn tail, like so it's a little tuft of hair. So I think Bambi with their little, little short tail. So it's an abnormal tuft of hair in the lumbosacral area. Um, if you see that on, a, on an infant examination, you need to order an ultrasound. That is the diagnostic test that you would order if you saw a fawn tail nevus because they can go in and then look at that area with ultrasound to see if there's any abnormal formation of the sac around the spine, okay? All right, your next question. A 21-year-old woman complains to you of a one-week episode of dysuria, frequency, and a strong odor to her urine. This is her second episode of the year. The previous UTI occurred three months ago. What is the most appropriate follow-up for this patient? Okay, A, order a urinalysis and urine for culture and sensitivity and treat the patient with antibiotics. B, order a urine culture and sensitivity and hold treatment until you get results from the lab. C, treat the patient with a seven-day course of antibiotics and order a culture and sensitivity now and after she completes her antibiotics. D, treat the patient with a stronger drug such as ofloxacin for 10 days. I'll read that one again because I know it was wordy. A 21-year-old woman complains to you of one-week episode of dysuria frequency and a strong odor to her urine. This is her second episode of the year. The previous UTI occurred three months ago. What is the most appropriate follow-up for this patient? A, order a urinalysis and culture and sensitivity and treat the patient with antibiotics. B, order a urine culture and sensitivity and hold treatment until you get the results from the lab. C, treat the patient with a seven-day course of antibiotics and order a urine culture, culture and sensitivity now and after she completes her antibiotics. Or D, treat the patient with a stronger drug, such as ofloxacin, for 10 days. What do we think? Awesome. Okay, we're kind of getting some answers all over, around, the, around the boat. All around. We can talk about this for sure. Yeah. All right, about half and half. We'll, we'll talk about this one. Spend some time on it. Okay. All right, so the correct answer for this one is actually A. So that one was order a urinalysis and urine for culture and sensitivity and treat the patient with antibiotics. Okay. So again, this is the second one she's had this year. We always do a culture and sensitivity so we can identify, but we don't withhold treatment. We go ahead and start the patient, you know, on what we would expect for her to have based off of, you know, certain criteria like age, gender. Um, so again, if it's, you know, if we're talking about a female, you know, we're thinking E. coli. So we can use one of our classics. We can use Cipro, Bactrim, Nitro, if she's pregnant or expecting, you know, to become pregnant, something like that. Um, and again, we are going to use a seven-day duration. We don't really recommend the three-day uh, duration um, for this patient we would not again we wouldn't wait until we had the results in two days to start we can go ahead and start treating now um, what, else? what else we don't need to try a stronger one yet Let's see what else was in here and we don't ever really need to do a follow-up culture and sensitivity for treatment. We don't do culture and sensitivities for treatment. That's kind of not in the current current guidelines. Uh, where things kind of change is after they've had three in a 12-month period. So if they've had three in a 12-month period, uh, you can go ahead and do your urine culture and sensitivity and treat. But you're also going to refer that patient to, to nephro because at that point we've had, you know, too many. With So three is a one-way ticket. Um, before that, we can go ahead and treat, and again, the things that you can treat with. A uh, good recommendation that I have for that would be Bactrim, Cipro, Nitro, Frantoin. So you can use those three, especially if we're talking females, okay? All right, let's move on to our next topic. Okay, so, 
clicked on something. There we go. <clears throat> During the eye exam of a 50-year-old hypertensive patient who is complaining of an onset of a severe headache, you find that the borders of the disc margins on both eyes are blurred. What is the name of this clinical finding? During the exam of a 50-year-old hypertensive patient who is complaining of an onset of a severe headache, you find that the borders of the disc margins on both eyes are blurred. What is the name of this clinical finding? A, normal optic disc, B, optic neuropathy, C, papilledema, or D, hypertensive retinopathy? What do we think this person has? Yep, good. A, normal, C, optic neuropathy, I'm sorry, B, optic neuropathy, C, papilledema, D, hypertensive retinopathy. What do we have here? Borders of the disc margins blurred. Patient has headaches. Patient has headaches. What are we thinking? Good, 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 good. Awesome. Yep, so the answer to this one would be C, papilledema. So when we're looking at this, especially when a patient has a new onset of headaches, we do like to go ahead and do a fundoscopic examination because it can, you know, give us some good data. So whenever we have uh, optic disc swelling, it kind of causes blurring of the, the disc margins. It kind of causes this overall, like, pink, angry look to your visual field back there. Um, so you can see uh, engorgement, you're, it's going to be bilateral, okay, because again, that pressure and that swelling is, is happening, you know, typically inside of the head, so it's going to affect both disc margins. So papilledema will always be bilateral. You know, glaucoma can vary from eye to eye, things like that. And diabetic retinopathy, you know, hypertensive retinopathy, it could affect, you know, both eyes differently. But when we have papilledema, that swelling, that intracranial pressure, um, especially from uncontrolled hypertension, it will affect both. Um, you'll have the loss of the venous pulsation. Venous pulsation is very, very hard to see anyways, so don't expect to be able to walk into clinical or your first year of, um, you know, being a nurse practitioner, being able to actually see venous pulsation. Uh, that's something that's very, you know, hard skill to master and something you won't master unless you're doing it frequently. Uh, okay, you can see some hemorrhages, so you might see like the cotton wool spot hemorrhages or flame hemorrhages, things like that, because if you think about papilledema, again, it's pressure. Think about what that would do in the brain, increased pressure. You could possibly have like little aneurysms, little bleeds, things like that. The same kind of process happens in the eye, so those um, veins and arteries inside of the eye might hemorrhage and bleed a little bit and have, you know, different looks to it. Okay. So that kind of covers a little bit about the fundoscopic examination. <clears throat> okay. Next question. A high school teacher complains of a dry cough for the past six weeks. It worsens when he is supine. He has episodes of heartburn, which he self-treats with over-the-counter antacids, and he chews mints for bad breath. Which of the following is a possible cause for this patient's cough? A, asthma, B, GERD, C, pneumonia, or D, chronic postnasal drip? A, asthma, B, GERD, C, pneumonia, D, chronic postnasal drip. Yeah, Glenda. Mm hmm. Good. Good, good. Yep. Good. All right, yes, the answer to this one is B. It's definitely the GERD. Um, it says he's worse when he's lying down, he's got heartburn, he's self-treating, he's chewing mints. Um, so all that leads me to believe out of those options that he has GERD. 
you know, asthma, of course, can cause a cough, but we'd see breathing difficulties, you know, triggers like exercise or allergens. That chronic postnasal drip absolutely can cause a cough, but the patient might be, you know, complaining of, of things that are related to allergies, sneezing, runny eyes, itchy nose, etc. So, yes, these things can definitely cause the cough, uh, but looking at what's in this question, it's pointing us towards a GI upset or GERD. Okay. Next question. The red reflex examination is used to screen for, red reflex examination is used to screen for A, cataracts, B, strabismus, C, blindness, or D, blinking response. A, cataracts, B, strabismus, C, blindness, or D, blinking response. Red reflex examination. Yeah, good job. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Good, 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 good. Mm-hmm. You guys knocked that one out of the park. Absolutely. So typically we're checking for the red leaf reflex to assess if a patient has cataracts. Um, so normally what we want to see is this orange to red color on both eyes. It needs to be symmetrical. Uh, and we also do it on the infant. When we're looking at the infant, we're looking for um, to see if they have like the white reflex. And if they have a white colored reflection, that's a, um, a thing that you might want to refer for because they could have a retinoblastoma or they could have like uh, congenital cataract and they were born with one. So anytime they have an abnormal, that's where your job stops. All you have to do is properly assess for one, and then as soon as you assess an abnormal one, you refer the patient to an ophthalmologist. That's where we kind of end um, as FNPs or just in family practice in general. So again, just assess for it. If you find an abnormal, asymmetrical, changing the color, et cetera, refer that patient to ophthalmology. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Next question, um, a 44-year-old man with Down syndrome starts to develop impaired memory and difficulty with his usual daily routine. He is having problems functioning at the job where he has been employed for the past 10 years. The physical exam and routine labs are all negative, vital signs normal, appetite normal. Most likely diagnosis is A, tic de la rue, B, stroke, C, Alzheimer's disease, D, delirium. What does this gentleman have? A, tic de la rue, stroke, C, Alzheimer's, D, delirium. Good, good, good. Yep. Yep, we're getting it for the most part, for sure, for sure. Yep, looks good. Yep, so the answer to this one uh, would be the C, the Alzheimer's disease. Um, patients with Down syndrome, they age a little bit faster, so they're, it's a, they get the, the Alzheimer's much faster than, you know, the typical general population. I saw a pe couple people pick uh, Tic de la Rue. Um, that is also known as trigeminal neuralgia. That's just pain um, coming from the trigeminal nerve, usually associated with uh, older, typically find it an older female. And they say it, they have pain when they chew, talk, or eat cold foods. Um, so not A, it is C, Alzheimer's disease. Again, there's a higher association with Down syndrome and, and Alzheimer's disease occurring much earlier in life. Okay. <laughs> which, next question, which of the following findings is associated with chronic use of chewing tobacco? What is associated with chronic use of chewing tobacco? A. Uh, ketosis and xerostomia, B, glossitis, C, geographic tongue, or D, leukoplakia and oral cancer. So A, ketosis and xerostomia, B, 
B, glossitis, C, geographic tongue, D, leukoplakia, and oral cancer. So which one of those is associated with chewing tobacco? Good. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Excellent. Yep. Looking good. Yep, everyone seems to have gotten that one right. Yep, that leukoplakia and oral cancer, okay? So leukoplakia or oral cancer. I've actually had the displeasure, I guess you could say, of actually of seeing this in, in person. Um you know, and it's painless. Typically, you'll find that the oral cancer associated with this is painless. Like, I cannot believe this did not hurt this man. Because he said, I've got this funny little white place under my tongue. And I said, okay. Flipped his tongue over, and he had this, like, as ulcerated with a white border. And he had all the positive things, like, you know, the chewing tobacco. And um, kind of this granulated look in the center of it. And, you know, that's probably, like, oral squamous cell carcinoma. <laughs> the leukoplakia starts off as a white patch. Um, I think... Don't quote me on this. I think like 2% of leukoplakia ends up being cancerous. Do not quote me on that one. Um, we have a question here. What is A associated with? Um, chelosis is like cracked corners. Xerostomy is dry mouth. So you could see that with a number of things like anticholinergic medications. Um, where people, a lot of people have chronic dry mouth from that. Uh, mouth breathing. I'm sure there's other reasons out there. But chelosis is like the cracked corners. Oh, um, there's a vitamin deficiency. Someone put that in. Which vitamin deficiency causes chelosis? And xerostomy, which is dry mouth, which is heavily associated with uh, medications. Okay. All right, um, next question. Uh, what does potassium hydroxide prep help the nurse practitioner diagnose? What does a potassium hydroxide or KOH uh, prep help the nurse practitioner diagnose? Linda Greer folate. Yeah, I think it's folate. I really think so. All right. Sorry. KOH prep. A, herpes zoster infection. B, fungal infections. C, herpes simplex infections. And D, viral infections. KOH, herpes. A, herpes zoster. B, fungal. C, herpes simplex. D, viral. What does KOH help with? Good O. Yep, good, good guys. Anne Marie, vitamin B, uh, that's the associated with the glossitis. Vitamin B is definitely associated with the glossitis. You get the glossy tongue. Yep, good job guys. Yep, yep. KOH helps us to decide if we have a patient with a fungal infection. So you can do typically like a vaginal swab or something like that if you're trying to decide what you got there. Um, like a yeast infection or tinea. You can do scrapings of tinea uh, and put that in some KOH and look under a microscope. And, you, of course, you're looking for hyphae and, um, you know, other things like that. The budding. Okay. It's kind of fun. I was in a rural clinic where we actually got to do a lot of those. So that was fun. Okay. All right. Next question. Uh, all of the following are considered SSRIs except. All of the following are considered SSRIs except. A, uh, imipramine or tofranil. B, fluoxetine or Prozac. C, sertraline, which is Zoloft. Or D, paroxetine, which is Paxil. Which of the following are SSRIs except? So A, imipramine, B, fluoxetine, C, sertraline, D, paroxetine. Robert, the previous question was what can we use KOH for? And we were saying that we could use it for fungal infections. Yep, good job, guys. Yep, yep. Absolutely. Yep. 
Yep, and the Pramine or Tofranil is a TCA or tricyclic antidepressant. The rest of those are our SSRIs. SSRIs, so Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil are all our SSRIs. Excellent job. Okay. Next question. All of the following pulmonary tests require the patient's voice to perform correctly except. All the following pulmonary tests require the patient's voice to perform correctly except. A, egophony. B, tactile fremitus. C, whispered pectoral, pectoraloquy. Or D, oscillation. Which one of those does not require the patient's voice? A, egophony, B, tactile fremitus, C, whispered pectoriloquy, or D, oscillation. Pretty good. We're doing pretty good here. Yep. All right, now I want you to go through first one. What is egophony? How do you elicit egophony? What is egophony? How do you elicit egophony? Because remember, boards love for us to know all these different signs. So first one, what is egophony? After you do that one, tell me what tactile fremitus is. So first is egophony. Then tell me what tactile fremitus is. After you answer that one, tell me what whispered pectoriloquy is. Okay, so go through and do those three. If you don't type it in, that's fine, just get it in your head. So, what is egophony? What is tactile fremitus? And what is whispered pectoriloquy? I know you know what oscillation is. <laughs> All right, good, we're getting some answers. <clears throat> getting some good answers here. And in general, like what we're looking for when we do these is consolidation, right? Because we're looking, we're trying to assess uh, for pneumonia with these patients, right? Okay. Yep, good things, good things. Okay, so let's review them. All right, tactile fremitus, so that's when we do vibrations, so we have the patient speak and we listen through the stethoscope. Um, and tactile fremitus is, fremitus is just listening, so tactile fremitus is when we, you know, we're going to be able to feel, so we're putting our, our hands on the patient's back. Um, the agophony, we're having them whisper. The whisper will be heard louder in areas of consolidation, okay? Okay. And I'm trying to remember what whispered pectoraloquy is. Whispered pectoraloquy. Oh, yeah, that's the loudness of whispering noted during oscillation. Yep. So we have them whisper one, two, three, and we're listening with our stethoscope. Okay? All right. Let's see, 50 minutes in. We still got time. Let's do a few more. All right, while checking for the red reflex on a three-year-old boy during a well-child visit, the nurse practitioner notes a white reflection on the child's left pupil. Which of the following conditions should be ruled out? We just talked about this one, okay? All right, A, unilateral strabismus, B, unilateral cataracts, C, retinoblastoma of the left eye, and D, color blindness of the left eye. All right, so we got, a, we got a white reflection on the left pupil. What is that? Unilateral strabismus, unilateral cataracts, retinoblastoma, or color blindness? Yep, you guys got it. We just talked about that one. Now it'll stick for sure. Yep, good job, guys. Yep, yep, yep. Excellent, good. Yep, everyone pick C, the retinoblastoma of the left eye. Good, because anytime you see that white reflex, pediatrics, retinoblastoma, refer. Absolutely. 
All right. All right, all right, all right. Next question, uh, let's see. All of the following infections are reportable diseases except. All the following infections are reportable diseases except. A, Lyme disease. B, gonorrhea. C, non-gonococcal urethritis. Or D, syphilis. A, Lyme disease, B, gonorrhea, C, non-gonococcal urethritis, and D, syphilis. Which one of those uh, is not reportable? Good. Yep, 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 good. Yep, everybody's looking good. The one that is not reportable is the non-gonococcal urethritis, things that we do want to report. Um, Lyme disease, gonorrhea, and syphilis, absolutely. Those are all ones that we do want to report. Um, good. Yep, everyone got that one right. So we don't have to uh, report non-gonococcal urethritis because that could be caused by a number of things. But if it is caused by gonorrhea, absolutely report. All right. Next question. A menopausal woman with osteopenia is attending a dietary education class. Which of the following foods are recommended? So we have osteopenia, we're menopausal, we're in dietary class. Which of the following foods are recommended? A, yogurt and sardines. B, spinach and red meat. C, cheese and red meat. D, low-fat cheese and whole grain. A, yogurt and sardines. B, spinach and red meat. C, cheese and red meat. D, low-fat cheese and whole grain. Which of these are we going to recommend to this postmenopausal woman with osteopenia? Good. Yep, looking good. What are we trying to increase in this patient? Think about that. Think about that in your head if you're having trouble. What, what vitamins do we really want to try to increase in this patient? Good job, guys. Yep. Yeah, we're trying to increase their calcium and vitamin D because of the bone problem. The best thing that we can do to prevent fractures in this in this patient population and help with osteopenia from progressing to osteoporosis is to have them increase their uh, vitamin D and calcium, as well as encouraging young women who are not menopausal yet to do exercises so that their muscles are strong around those bones. Um, that helps in the future. So good diet, good exercise, really good prevention. You know, that's really our goal here. So with the yogurt and sardines, you know, that's giving us, you know, good sources of calcium and, and good sources of vitamin D right there. <clears throat> All right, good job. Yeah, let's keep, we'll do a few more. Okay. Uh, that one's, I'll skip that one. I like that one. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find a good one because we only have you know we only have time for a couple more. All right, when the nurse practitioner is evaluating a patient for intermittent claudication, he or she would first when the nurse practitioner is evaluating a patient for intermittent claudication, he or she would first A order a venogram, B order TED anti embolism stockings. C, check the ankle and brachial blood pressure before and after exercise. D, check the pedal and posterior tibial pulses. So we're evaluating a patient for intermittent claudication. What should we do first? Make sure you pay attention to wording of these questions. It's asking what should we do first? And when we think about that, we always think about least invasive to most invasive, what's appropriate, what red flags are we looking for? All right, A, order a venogram. B, order TED, anti-embolism stockings. C, check the ankle and brachial blood pressures before and after exercise. Or D, check the pedal and posterior tibial pulses. What is the appropriate first thing that we do when assessing for this? Okay. Seeing a couple different answers through here, yep. How do we diagnose intermittent claudication? What can we do for this patient? What are we gonna check first? 
Okay, what we're going to do for this patient is we're going to check the ankle and brachial blood pressures before and after exercise, okay? So that is our initial evaluation. We have them, uh, you know, we come in, we check their ankle and brachial, and then we do some exercise, and we should see, you know, increased pressures in, in the brachial area, but not as high in the ankle area because we're going to have a perfusion problem because we're having a claudication problem, meaning we're not perfusing certain areas. So that's the test that we're going to do is we're going to do the ankle, ankle and brachial um, blood pressures before and after exercise in order to diagnose. <laughs> and then after that, you know, there's different things that we do. But that's step one. Always know, you know, always know your step one. All right, let's do one more question. Let's do one about a heart murmur, okay? Um, you note a high-pitched and blowing, high-pitched and blowing, pan-systolic murmur while assessing a 70-year-old male patient. It is a grade two out of six and is best heard at the apical area. Which of the following is most likely? A, ventricular septal defect. B, tricuspid regurgitation. C, mitral regurgitation, or D, mitral stenosis. Okay, so we had high-pitched, blowing, pan-systolic murmur, 70-year-old male, grade 2 of 6, and it's best heard at the apical area. Which of the following is most likely? Ventricular septal, tricuspid regurgitation, mitral regurg, or mitral stenosis. Okay. Which one is this? Lost my mouse again. Good, excellent, guys, excellent. So the boards are pretty nice when it comes to murmurs. It's pretty much going to pick either a mitral problem or an atrial problem. It's going to define whether it's systolic or diastolic, and then it's going to tell you where it's heard. Those three pieces of information can help you get pretty much all of those. Uh, questions right. Um, think about the mnemonics that both Leek and Hollier use. I use Mr. Pass MVP and Miss Ard. So Mr. Pass MVP standing for mitral regurg, physiologic, atrial uh, stenosis, um, systolic is the next S, and MVP is mitral valve prolapse. And then I use Miss Ard, which is mitral stenosis, aortic regurg, diastolic. So you can help you remember which ones are in which category. So make sure you know those mnemonics and then know the two pieces of information about where it's heard. So mitral are always heard in the apical area or fifth intercostal space. They always say they can always say something like refers to the armpit. And then atrial are heard in the second intercostal space. That's where that's typically described as, and it radiates to the neck. So if you can differentiate between mitral location and atrial location and then memorize those two mnemonics and to, to help you know if it was a systolic or diastolic you can pretty much diagnose all of the heart murmurs you're getting here on boards that's pretty much it the heart murmurs don't let it terrify you okay all right that wraps it up for us tonight we just about hit our hour-long mark uh, i really really enjoy doing these with you guys i love you know this being a part of my week is Hey, we're going to get on together and we're going to learn some stuff. My heart really lies in education. <clears throat> of course, um, I have a website for you guys to visit uh, that has, you know, some more resources there if you're looking for extra materials. Um, if you're wanting, you know, tutoring sessions or things like that, or, you know, message me about that. We can look into setting those up. We can just do practice questions together like this or, you know, hey, I'm having a ton of trouble with my derm. Can we go over derm for you know, part of the time, and we'll go over pulmonary stuff over the other half, you know, stuff like that. So, um, you know, we can, you know, whatever you think, whatever you want to go over, okay? But if not, I'll keep doing my uh, light, free lightning rounds on here. You know, that's, you know, enough for me. I love doing that every week. So I'll see you guys next week, and we'll, you know, do it again. It was great seeing you. Yeah, bye.